the world, class two. Thanks for coming in. Expected it to be a little bit lighter this week just due to the holiday. Um, and there's always some people who kind of come in the first class and, and uh, aren't that into it, which is fine. So uh, thanks for, for sticking around and come making it into the second class. Um, before we get started, kind of some admin stuff. Um, there's no office hours this coming Monday because of the holiday. So the Mentor Center will be closed. If you want help with your um, your class homework or with uh, Summer of Code pre-work, any of that stuff, you can come into the Mentor Center Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, generally. Um, there are mentors around to help, uh, at least currently during those days. So you can come in if you missed, um, if you were banking on coming in Monday, you can come in one of those other days. Um, and again, just to emphasize the Summer of Code application and the pre-work, if you're putting it off, if you're anxious about it, if you think I'll do it when I have more time, I'll do it next weekend, the day before the deadline, will be plenty of time. Don't do that because you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. So if you have any questions about it, again, ask me after class, um, particularly the pre-work, because if you've been tentatively admitted um, and you're in this class, you should be able to get through that pre-work. And if you're having trouble or don't understand how to do it, we don't want that to be a barrier to you participating in the class. So uh, don't put it off and don't um, wait or hesitate to ask questions. Some other admin stuff, I want to clarify about the homework for this class. There's no grades for this class. We're not, we don't have, you know, transcripts or, or we don't keep like um, detailed records about all the homework that you do. Um, and that's kind of just the style of education that LaunchCode does. It's a community education model. We're here to provide opportunities for people. We're not here to issue diplomas, right? So if you want to do the work and you want to learn, we anticipate that you will hold yourself accountable. If you have questions about stuff, you get stuck on stuff, you can't finish the homework, that's where we come in and we help you get through it. But we're not going to look over your shoulder and poke you to do every single little thing. We don't have the time to do that, and that's also not what should be motivating you. Okay, so getting an A in this class, if there were such a thing, should not be your motivation. Your motivation should be engaging with the material, learning the concepts, and moving on towards uh, a career in technology. And those things are the things that uh, we think are most important in, in um, how we administer the class and how we spend our time. So um, the, you don't have to turn anything in. There's no like completion like benchmark for the class. Um, just do it. And if you get stuck, ask us. That's kind of the, the way we operate here. Any questions about homework or, or how uh, that stuff goes? Did everybody uh, at least get started on the homework last week and get through some of it? Did it go okay? Cool. All right. So let's review a little bit. Um, last week, we focused on just kind of getting an idea for what code is at a very kind of high level. Um, here is a snippet of code pretty similar to what we wrote last time. Uh, a little bit different. This one has a function. But generally, it's a, you know, it's a hello world kind of program. So um, this was copied and pasted from another class that I did. But it's more or less what we wrote in class together last time. Uh, and so that's the extent to which we've seen code so far. So fairly straightforward, just a few lines at a time, just a few things that we're using in terms of the, the utility of code. Uh, but generally, code is, again, it's a, a program is a set of instructions written in a particular language. It runs generally top to bottom. We'll see that that's not exactly the case all the time. Um, and it carries out one instruction at a time. And you, as the programmer, are the one responsible for how the computer operates. The code is really kind of computers and, and, and programming languages are generally kind of kind of dumb. They only do what we tell them to do. Uh, they're, they're do as you say, not do as you mean. OK, so an algorithm. This is a word that um, we, we when we do the four session version of this class, we spend a lot of time talking about algorithms and pseudocode. Uh, that's one of the things we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this time around. Um, but just want to introduce the word. We talk, You probably heard it come up in class last time and probably in some of the other uh, things you were looking at and reading. An algorithm is simply, it's a step-by-step -step set of operations to be, for, to be performed to carry out a specific task. Okay, so um, I think maybe I did this analogy last week. If you look, think about Facebook, Facebook is a program. If you look at one particular feature or one particular task that you can carry out in Facebook, create a new post, upload a photo, things like that, um, that would be more of the size of an algorithm. An algorithm is, is, a, is a procedure to solve one specific task. So your code, your programs, will contain several algorithms. So this is a word you'll hear a lot. Uh, just get familiar with it. Um, and generally, an algorithm doesn't have to apply to computer programming. So you can refer to an algorithm in the context of pseudocode or just anything in your day-to-day -day life about how to do something, how to decide. You can create an algorithm for how to decide where to go to dinner with your friends, right? That can be, that's a valid algorithm. Okay, and then we talked a lot about JavaScript, at least introducing ourselves to the basics, some little uh, fundamentals 
of JavaScript. So let's go back and look at some of the things that we did just to review. We're not going to spend too much time, but I do want to just give us a warm up here. Out in JSBin. Better. Readable for folks. Cool. If anything's ever not readable or too small or whatever, just yell at me. I know you're far away back there. So review. So we talked about data types and variables. Okay. So we had three types of data that we talked about last time. You can tell me one or two of them. Here's more broadly, an integer is almost there, but there's a more general term. What about 1.5? number, right? So some programming languages will distinguish between an integer and a, what's called a float or a number with a decimal place. JavaScript doesn't. Um, everything is just considered a number. So an integer would just be a whole number, something without a decimal place. Uh, something else. So we had two more that we talked about. String and Boolean. So some examples we had. Um, uh, we could also create variables, right? So we used var to create variables. So I'm going to make some variables here with different data types. And again, just to reiterate, you're going to see sometimes JavaScript code uh, that doesn't use the word var in front of a new variable. It's going to create variables without doing that sometimes. Sometimes that's done intentionally. Usually it's done very lazily, and usually it's bad code. So unless you really know why you want to leave off the var keyword and why you want to create a variable without using var, you should probably do it. And, and unless you understand what you're doing by leaving off var, which means you're clearly, for those that have coded before, it means you're creating a global variable, which is generally a bad thing. You should always use the var keyword. So JavaScript is, a, is more flexible than most languages, and I'm going to continue to reiterate certain things that JavaScript will let you do that you should not do, because as a new programmer, it's easy to get bad habits sometimes by, by being lazy about these things. So var, var uh, let's create a number variable. Var is, um, let's see. Number of burritos. Number burritos three. We can say var, we can create vars that are not whole numbers. Uh, what's an example of ERA? And that's something that off that 4.45. That's not a good ERA. So you can create variables that are floats or have decimal places. We can have uh, strings, and a string is marked by double quotes. Something we didn't really talk about explicitly is that you can do strings with single quotes as well. Okay, so those are interchangeable for the most part. One little trick you can do is you can use, if you want to, um, I should sentence with a conjunction. Use quotes inside of quotes if you're using the alternate form of the quote, right? So you can put a single quote inside of a double quote, and that's gonna not going to mess up your, your, uh, your string. If I were to do something like this, if I were to say put the single quotes here, <clears throat> notice what happens. The syntax, the syntax highlighting in JSBin is being helpful uh, right now in saying, before that string was entirely red, and now when I switched my outer quotes to single quotes, it turned it to partially red and partially black. And that's indicating that that first single quote that I'm using in the conjunction don't is actually terminating the string. And what's after that is no longer a portion of a string. So it's being helpful. Syntax highlighting will, will often be helpful in telling you things that you screwed up. So you can use quotes inside of quotes. You just have to use the opposite, the, the opposite of the single or double quote that you're using to enclose the string. Does that make sense to folks? Okay, cool. So let's put our double quotes back. And Booleans, what was a Boolean? What was the, the kind of the newer one, the kind of more foreign concept that we learned last week? It could be true or false. So you can create a variable called is weekend. A lot of times you'll see Booleans, uh, Boolean variables preceded by the word is or can or some kind of word that indicates that it has a state of true or false or it's testing some condition. Um, var can vote. If you're under 18, var can vote might be false for you. Um, so those are the two values. And true or false here, they're just, they stand on their own. There's no quotes. There's no special things we have to do there, which 
um, is the case because they're special words in JavaScript. They're, they're reserved words, OK? All right, any questions about variables, data types, anything like that? Yes, sir. There are only two options in, in Boolean, true or false. Yeah, right. So some, some programming languages, if you've seen other programming languages before, you will create variables with um, specific types. Like you might say, this is a Boolean variable, right? We're not doing that here. We're just saying, by using the var keyword, we're just saying, this is a variable. It could have uh, a Boolean value, but I could also just reset its value. It's fine nonsensical and the programming language doesn't care okay so JavaScript as a language you will see this when you go on to program in other languages um, often there is some for, form of uh, uh, typing with your variables your variables might be only able to be one type or another depending on how you created them JavaScript is going to let you put whatever you want into any variable you want for the most part okay so I can take a boolean and turn it into an elephant all right so um, Hello world. I just want to pull this up briefly. I put this in yesterday or today. I left it out. So if you were looking for the sample code that I promised I would give you, I did link it into the in-class section of, uh, of last classes. So here's the hello world example that we did last time. Okay, We, we created a variable called name. We use this thing called prompt, which we kind of just took for granted that it did what I told you it did. We didn't really understand totally what we were doing. But what, we, what, what did we see happened when we called, uh, when we used that prompt thing? What happened when we ran our program? We can just try it here again. It prompts me for some data, right? It's going to ask for some input. And I can say, type in my name. Program then prints, hello, Chris. Um, so I'm bringing this up because the first thing we're going to introduce today as a new concept is the idea of a function. And so uh, let me let me just put this in here. Let me use because this is the one we used last time, right? Use console. That log. So if I type in my name there, it then prints hello Chris over here in the console. So we used prompt last time, and we used console.log last time, and we just kind of took for granted that that they would do the things I told you to, and they were kind of mysterious and black boxy for us last time. So I want to talk about more about what these things actually are um, now. Oh, actually, let me give you, yeah, so here's what we're going to talk about today, my next slide. I'm not paying close attention to my slides. We're going to talk about functions and conditionals, and hopefully we're going to talk about loops. This is a lot of stuff, and you're going to talk about the stuff all again if you take the Summer of Code or pretty much any other programming class. We're going to cover it kind of fast-ish, but we're not going to expect you to like know every gory detail about these things as we go. Um, the idea with this class is to expose you to ideas, not to master them. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about functions. And uh, hopefully the other two will. We'll definitely have time for conditionals, maybe not time for loops. So functions. What is a function? Here's like the definition-y kind of phrasing of a function. Um, a function is a block of code that we can reuse or call at other places in our code. So remember the couple of videos that we watched last week and talked about, uh, talked about how programming languages will let you do things in a repeated fashion. They'll let you carry out the same task again and again and again. Functions are one of the ways in which you can do that. You can repeat. If you have something that you want to do multiple times within your code, you don't want to go copying and pasting that, that stuff throughout your program, right? You should have it in one place. So functions are basically what it's going to allow us to do that. And here are just some properties of functions to, to think about as you think about what a function is. And this is by no means a comprehensive definition of what a function is, especially in JavaScript. Uh, a function can take zero to many input parameters. We can give our functions input and say, hey, uh, calculate something based on this initial condition. Um, or print something out based on this data I just have given you. They can also hand data back to you. So when you use a function in your program, you'll often get data back in return. So some of you kind of worked ahead in the Code Academy stuff and, and were asking questions about the return statements. That's kind of a, a tricky concept when you first see it. So we'll spend some time looking at uh, how data is returned from a function. Uh, and then functions can also carry out work that isn't returned. They can kind of have some side effect as you run the function that it, it does something, but you don't necessarily see the results of that directly in the data that's handed back to you. So uh, we'll see what these actually mean in practice. Um, it's kind of abstract to think about them this way, but, but I wanted to put them out there. 
here's the anatomy of a function. I'll come back to this. We'll look at this a little bit, and then we'll come back to this after we've looked at some different examples. So a function, just to highlight the pieces that I just mentioned, a function can um, take data. So you see in the top line, the, t the block's level and score. That's where those are data being put into our function. Inside of the brackets, inside of the block, there's some code being operated on. And then there's a return statement at the bottom that is passing data back out of our function. Okay, so we'll come back and look at this diagram once we've seen some examples of these things. So let's let's do just that. Let's look at some functions. So the the main point of bringing that hello world thing back up is that um, we used functions already. We've already seen them. We've already used functions in our code. We just didn't really know exactly what to call them or what they were doing for us. We just kind of typed whatever I told you to type, right? So we've got two functions in our uh, code right here that we used last time. Can anybody name the two functions that we that we used last time that are in the the bottom couple lines of code? One of them's highlighted. That's a gimme. Prompt. Okay. And there's one more. Yeah, console.log. So those are the two functions we used. So uh, these both did things for us, right? We don't know how to really like make a window appear on the screen to ask the user to put some data into it, right? When I run this program, that's what happens. Do we know how to make that window? We don't know how to do this, right? We just call this function prompt, and it, gets, it just does it for us. It knows how to interact with the browser. Actually, this is something that's built into the browser. Um, but the browser knows how to make the window. It knows how to make a window with like a little OK and a cancel button and a field. And it puts our little message in just the right spot, enter your name. It knows how to do all of that. We have no idea how to do that, but we don't have to. We can just use this function that's given to us. Uh, it's a little handy utility that's in every browser in the world. So. Um, it's doing some some stuff for us. Uh, the second one, console.log, did some stuff for us, which was to take some text that we had it create by joining two strings together, three strings actually. Hello, the name that was input, and the exclamation point. To join those strings together and then print them somewhere where we told it to, the console. So the console is kind of a mysterious place. Right now it's over here. When we're looking at JavaScript in a web page, it'll be somewhere else. Uh, just think of the console as the output stream. It's where um, you're able to write data, one of the places you're able to write data in JavaScript. We don't know where it is. We don't know how the data ends up over here from the console. It just does, right? The function does it for us. We don't have to worry about where the console is or how it's doing that. Uh, we just get to use it for free. So there are functions that are built into JavaScript or built into the browser or some library you might use that will do these things. They'll just do things for you. You don't have to care about how they work, but you can also write your own functions. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on a little bit today. So let's look at, um, let's write a new function to kind of do a hello world kind of, kind of behavior. So there are multiple ways you can write functions in JavaScript. I am going to do primarily this one. Okay, so. I've just done the bare minimum amount of work that I need to create a function in JavaScript. The two pieces I have there are the keyword function, which tells uh, the JavaScript interpreter, it says, hey, I'm about to write a function. Okay? I can't, I can't leave that off. Unlike var, I can't say this. Okay? So that's an important keyword function. It says, I'm about to write a function. After that, the word hello is the name of the function. If I want to use that function later, I have to refer to it by its name, the same way we refer to variables by their names. So by putting that hello there right after the keyword, the function keyword, I'm designating the name of my function. Uh, then I have two other pieces. I have parens, open, open and close, which are currently empty. I have open and close brackets, which are also currently empty. Okay, um, And just to follow up on some some uh, common questions at this point. If you're new to, if you're totally new to programming, some people have asked. They've seen differences in this. They said, "Oh, Code Academy does it this way. Uh, the brackets are on other lines." Generally, white space in programs for the most part doesn't matter. So, uh, where you put your braces, as long as they're with respect to white space, otherwise in the same spot, relatively in the same place, it's not going to matter if they're on the same line or the next line or even. 
So within parens, um, this is a special place for this first iteration of our function, hello, we're not gonna do anything here, but here's where you would normally put your input parameters. So if you wanted to be able to pass data into your function, if your function required data, that's where you would specify which data was being passed into the function. And we'll see what that means uh, as we iterate on this example. And then what's between the brackets, what will be between the brackets is the most, perhaps the most important part of the function, which is the, the code that actually gets run when you use the function, okay? We're gonna write a function. I said console log and prompts we didn't write, we just got to use. We're gonna write a function here. So whatever happens when someone uses our function is gonna be the, based on the code that we write um, in between these, these uh, curly braces, okay? And curly braces, like parens, like I mentioned last time, should always come in pairs. And where they are and how they match up is very important to how your code uh, operates and to making sure it operates properly. So let's do the simplest version of a, a hello function. Let's just hello. And the way we know how to do that is to use console.log. Okay. Oh, I got my output panel open instead of my console. Hello. Oh, mistake. So I've written a function, right? That code that I've just put in the function doesn't actually run until I call my function. So that's a good, a good learning step right there. If I want my code to actually run, I need to actually call the function. So here, let's just put a comment to say what we're doing. Um, call function. Here, we define the function. Think of as create. Usually in programming, we'll use the word define, but create is also another way to think about that. Um, just by virtue of creating a function doesn't mean that code runs when you run your program. It's just, um, it's just defining it, saying, hey, here's this function. If anybody wants to use it, here's what'll happen when you run it. It's not actually running the code yet. Uh, the code only gets uh, executed when you call the function. To call the function, you're gonna use this syntax down on line 20, which says the name of the function Again, with the open close um, parens. And so here, these are gonna, as you might guess, be related to the open close parens up here. We'll see how. Um, right now, since my function doesn't have any input parameters, I don't need to put anything here. I can just say open close. But think of the open close parens as saying, hey, go run this thing called hello. If I didn't have these, JavaScript would think that hello was probably a variable of some type and try to interpret that way, okay? so. Even if your function doesn't require any input parameters, you still need to put the parens there to signify to the interpreter, this is a function that I'm calling. Because we could also have a variable called hello. And if I leave those off, that would refer to the variable called hello, not the function called hello. Okay, so by doing this, when I run, that code gets executed, right? Um, and I can do it again, and again, as you might expect, three times, okay? So there's some efficiency here. This is kind of a baby example. It's a, it's a training wheels example. I could have just written three console.log hello statements in a row and the same thing would have happened, right? But what if my function had 50 lines of code? I just saved myself a lot of, a lot of uh, both space and potential mistakes by putting 50 lines of code within a function so that when I use it three times in a row, I'm using that same 50 lines three times rather than copying and pasting the 50 lines three times. Make sense? Um, so we don't really care about saying hello three times. Let's go back and kind of iterate on our function definition or, and, and kind of learn some, uh, add some more pieces to it. So what, what can we do now with our function? What might be a way to beef this up and give it some more uh, interesting behavior? This says hello right now. What did we do last time with our hello, hello example? Hello name, so I could say var name. Equals back, okay. and then I could add that here. Let's say hello. I'm going to put space comma just for nice formatting. I'm going to use plus. Remember, plus uh, will join two strings together. We'll concatenate them, and then I can put name after that. I run my function. I can say, hello, Zach. Okay, that's pretty cool. It's a little bit more complicated now. Um, but 
even better, what might I be able to do? What did we do last time to get, to get a name? We saw it at the beginning when I went through the example again. We asked the person what their name was, okay? So I could, here I could do the same thing. I could say, oh, I would put it up here. Say prompts. Is your name? It's a totally reasonable thing to do, right? If we did that, we would get what we expect. It's going to prompt us. Now, when I enter the name, it's going to print out "hello, comma space name." Okay, that's one thing we can do. But now we are now we're in the world of functions. Now we have a little bit more flexibility in terms of how this actually happens. And instead of actually uh, prompting the user for the name, I could let the person that calls the function tell me what the name is. Maybe the name is going to come from a prompt. Maybe it comes from a file. Maybe they already know the person's name. They're in some program and they've got some variable already stored where they already know the person's name. So let's just say we want our function to be able to take a predefined name and print it out. So this is where we're going to use input parameters. Okay. So here, if I go to my function definition, Right after the, the, the word hello, right after the function name, I've got my open and close parens. Here's where I define what data gets passed into my function. Okay? Uh, here I'm going to say that I'm going to accept one input parameter to my function, and it's going to be called name. Um, so that input parameter, you can think of that as a variable. Okay? Think of it as a variable that's just automatically created for your function when you're, when you're using your function. Because I can use it in the same way. So right here, I can call this guy, this input parameter name, the same way I referred to it before when it was just a variable, and it'll work basically the same way. Okay. So now I can say hello. Let's, let's go ahead and run this code as it is. Okay, interesting. What just happened? So my function ran when I called it down on line 20. And when it ran, it printed out hello, comma, undefined. Any guesses? I called the function without an input parameter, right? I didn't, I didn't tell it what the name should be. I just kind of left it blank down there. And consequently, when it ran, oops, sorry. Consequently, when it ran, name didn't have a value. The input parameter, the variable, if you want to think of it that way, inside of our function, definition didn't have a value. So what happens when you actually call this function? This code gets executed, right? The code in between here. And whatever value that I put in between the parens will be replaced, uh, will be put in place of the name parameter. I didn't put a value there, so therefore name didn't have a value. And so the, in JavaScript, what that means is there's a, there's a default value. It's kind of a special value called undefined. Um, and you'll see this again and again and again in your code if you mess up or if you try to use a variable that doesn't have any data in it, et cetera, you'll see undefined pop up a lot. Here, that's just saying that undefined is kind of your clue that that name thing didn't have anything inside of it. It was like a variable that was empty. It's undefined. We haven't given it anything. We haven't defined it. So in order to properly uh, use this function, I need to pass some input. Good boy. I want to run it. I get hello, Zach. Okay, pretty cool. Now here's the efficiency that um, we can get from this function. Now I can call hello multiple times and say hello Chris. I can say hello Jesse. When I run this stuff, I do all those things in order. Okay. So obviously, again, simple example, but you can see how this might be useful in the long term. Uh, with more complicated behaviors. Any questions about functions and how they're working at this point? Got a couple more concepts around functions to introduce. You doing okay? Okay, cool. So two more things we're going to do with functions. We're going to see, let's do, uh, let's do multiple parameters. <clears throat> so what if I want to, instead of just giving the function, my hello function, instead of just taking a name, what if I also want it to be multilingual? And I can pass in a greeting. So in, instead of just saying hello, now I'm going to say greeting. I'm going to use greeting in place of the word hello. So you can say hello in Spanish or French or Swahili or whatever you want um, by just passing in that greeting, and then we'll put the message together and then print it out. Okay, so now 
now if I run my functions the same way, uh, okay. So here, again, I've added a parameter, but I haven't added it into the function calls, right? So let's just do a simple one. Say hello to Zach. Say bonjour, Chris. And we'll say uh, aloha. and goodbye, right? Cool. So now it, you can see what happens. It took those two pieces, joined them together, created a new output message in each case. All right? So just to reiterate what I did here, in defining the function, I gave it two input parameters, and that was uh, by putting a comma between them. Okay? Just like variables, input parameters can't have spaces or anything crazy in there. Once I'm inside my function, I can use both of those input parameters just by referring to them the same way I would a variable. And when I call my function, then I uh, give it both of those input parameters in each case that I call it. What will happen if I leave one out? What will happen in this case, in the fourth line? Hello, comma, undefined. Yeah, because I haven't given it a name. So this is another thing. JavaScript, I keep saying this. JavaScript's a little bit more flexible. It's not going to smack you over the head every, every time you do something stupid. Here, we really need to give our function two parameters, right? It really doesn't work the way it's supposed to unless we give it two parameters. JavaScript is going to let us do it, though. In some cases, this is actually really useful. Sometimes you might not want to have to, to be forced to provide two parameters to your functions. Um, and JavaScript, for that reason, is actually sometimes really cool, but it's also going to let you do stupid things, which you often sometimes don't mean to do. So here, I called my function without a name. It's not going to work the way I want it to, but it'll still work. I'm not going to get any errors. My program's not going to blow up. Just the end result is not what I intended, okay? So um, most other programming languages will enforce you to provide two input parameters. If you say, hey, I've got a greeting and a name, and my function won't run without both of them, when you call your function, you would get an error if you didn't provide both in, in, in many programming languages. Um, so just something to be aware of. All right. Um, and you, just another note, you can make as many, you don't have to have any input parameters to your function, and, and you can basically make as, as many as you want. I think there is like an actual limit. I think 255 is the most, 255 is the most input parameters you can give to your functions. Um, but for all practical purposes, that's infinity, right? If you're writing a function with 255 input parameters or you need more than that, you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, so you can provide five, six, seven, eight different parameters uh, to your functions. Okay, so last concept in a function is the idea of returning data. We've seen how to pass data into our functions. Now let's look at how to get data back out. So I'm going to wipe out these guys for now. Well, no, I'll leave them there. I'll leave one of them there. So what if instead of uh, my function just printing something to the screen, I just wanted it to create the message and give it back to the user and let them decide what to do with it. Maybe they want to put it in a file. Maybe they want to put it in a web page. Maybe they want to, you know, who knows what they want to do with it. But let's let them make that decision. Instead of, by default, putting it to the, uh, printing it to the console, I can get rid of that and I can say return. Dude, let me do one more step here just to make this a little bit more clear what's going on. Okay. So now in my function, I've created a new variable called message. And the value of that, remember, one equals means assignment. It means put the value on the right-hand side into the thing on the left-hand side, is going to be the string I get from concatenating these three different pieces, the input greeting, uh, the string comma space, and then the name after that. So that message, after uh, line 25 runs, that message variable will have a fully formed string from those three pieces. And then down below, I use the keyword return. Return is, again, a special word. And I say return message. And what that does is it takes the value that's in that variable and hands it back to the person that called the function. Okay which is very, very useful. So let's just run this and see what happens right now. Did that not save? 
something weird just happened. There we go. That's what should have happened. OK, so I ran this function, and nothing happens. Right? That's expected. Why is that expected? Why didn't I see anything printed out to the screen? Because I took out the console.log, right? There's no code in there printing anywhere whatsoever. I took it out. I ripped it out. Nowhere am I printing to the screen. Down here where I'm calling my function, I call it with the input parameter hello and with the input parameter Zach. It's going to create that message, and my function is going to return. It's going to hand the message back to me, but I'm not doing anything with it. I just drop it, basically. In order to hold on to it, I need to put it somewhere. I need to put it in a variable. One way we can we can hold on to it. Now, if I create a variable, set it equal to the return value of the function, now at this point, I can print it out. So what happened here? This is this is an if if this makes total sense, this is great. But I'm going to go through this uh, very very slowly because this is a complicated thing for people to kind of visualize mentally, and it's very very important. What happens when I call the function hello? Let's go through this step by step. All right? When I call hello, it takes this string and this string, and it puts them in respectively these two put these two input parameters. Okay. Then it runs the code inside of the function. It's going to run these two lines. When I run this line, it's going to package up that string. It's going to concatenate it. When I hit line 17, the return keyword says, take whatever's in that variable and send it back. Return it to the user. Okay. So at this point, I've called my function. The function has returned a value by setting it to the right-hand side of an assignment operation, by putting it on the right-hand side of an equals, I'm putting that value into a variable. I'm putting it into a box and holding on to it for later use. If I don't do that, that value will literally just fall on the floor. Okay. Now, once I have that value in my new variable, I can do whatever I want with it. I can, I can leave it alone. I can do more mayhem to it. I can chop it up. I can print it somewhere. Uh, in this case, I chose to put a console.log. Let's do something else with it, just because we can. I'm going to use another function. Similar to prompt, there's a function called alert, which is built in to, uh, to all browsers in, in the world. And alert, rather than printing something to a console, will print it in this. It's kind of hard to read, probably, if you're in the back, but that middle line of text has our hello, Zach message. Alert will print your message to a little pop-up. So you've all seen these. You see them every single day on the internet, right? You get hit in the face with these all the time, especially if you're on a spammy news site. Um, these are just like part of the furniture of, of the internet, these little alert dialogue guys, and so are the prompt guys. Um, and so this is, you know, by, by virtue of creating a function which just returned the message, didn't print it out, I let the user who called the function decide what to do with it, OK? I let them decide, do they put it in the console? Do they put it in an alert dialog? Do they put it in a file? Whatever they want to do with it, they can do that. Yeah, question. Uh, I don't think so. Um, no, if, if you can, nobody ever does. Basically, nobody actually uses those in real world. I said, just said you see them all the time. But as a programmer, if you're actually using alert or, or prompts, uh, there are some cases where you might want to do that. Most of the time, you're going to be using something else, which will allow you more customization on your your uh, your dialogues. Any other questions at this point? How are we doing? Does this all make sense? If this if the return part doesn't make sense, let me know right now. This is a really crucial thing, and it really can be really confusing. Awesome! This is like the best time I've ever taught this class, and everybody gets it the first time. You guys, are, you guys are good. You guys are really good. OK. So um, now let's just look at another example of a function. Um, we're going to do, just do something else. We've seen one example of creating our function. We kind of took uh, this hello world kind of thing and kind of iterated on it and did something with it. Um, another kind of canonical function that people often uh, see when introduced to the concept is the square function. I'm going to write this function. And we'll kind of go through the steps after I'm done with it. So uh, I'm going to call my function square. It's going to get one input parameter. 
And it's going to do, what might you guess this is going to do? Square and number, good guess. So uh, to square a number, I just multiply it by itself, right? Do that, I can say x times x. That's not really useful unless I give that thing back to the user, right? So the return keyword there, and that will take the result of multiplying x by itself and send it back to the user. Cool. Um, this is a little bit more complicated than what we saw above, just, but just to reiterate, this return, this return statement is different from the one up here in what way? What important way? Here I'm returning what? Uh, a, it happens to be a string, but more, more accurately, more specifically, what is it? What is message? Not what's inside of it, what is it? It's a variable. Okay, it happens to have a string in it because that's what my function put inside of it. But it could have a number, it could be empty, it could have a Boolean, whatever, but it's still a variable. I'm returning a variable, okay? So when I wrote this function the first time this way, I kind of backed up and made that variable um, just to kind of make it a little bit clear what was happening where, but I don't have to do that. I can just return a statement. And what happens when I return a statement is that statement gets evaluated first. I have x times x. Uh, JavaScript is going to take those two numbers, multiply them by themselves, and take that result, and then that's what's going to get returned. That's what's going to get passed back. Okay, so I could I could equally do this. I could say var results equals x times x, and then I could return results. I could do that. Um, if it helps you to do this while you're learning functions, by all means, go for it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing this. However, you'll quickly graduate to the point where you see that um, this way is much more concise. You're going to see this a lot. Uh, this is the way most people will, will choose to return a value of a function, um, is we actually just put that statement in the return. So it's going to take the result of that x times x, and that's what's going to be passed to the user. So let's try a couple things here. Easy one, right? Um, well, let me let me let me get rid of this. I'm out so it doesn't run while we're looking. Come on. Oh yeah, I didn't actually do anything with it. Thank you. I've done that twice today. Oh, so we're in the function, but I didn't do anything with it, right? So that's a good, again, another good lesson. Saturday morning, need some more coffee. What happened when I ran the square function? We didn't see anything output, right? We didn't see any results of that work. The work was being done, but we didn't do anything with the answer. The function was called, two was squared, four was handed back to the user, but we just let it fall on the floor, okay? So let me go ahead and I'm just going to do this. I print it out. Again, this is kind of something new. Before, before I've mostly printed out variables. Here, I'm just saying, call this function square with the value two, and then whatever you get back, just go ahead and print that out right away. You don't need to put that in a variable. Just go ahead and print it out right away. Yes. You mean like kind of like we did up here in the hello to create a variable and then return the variable versus like this way? Is that what you're saying? It doesn't matter. If we do it right now, do whatever you're most comfortable with, whatever makes most sense to you. If one way makes sense and the other one's kind of like a little bit weird, I don't totally know what's going on. If that's the feeling you get when you return a statement, go ahead and make a variable and return the variable. Just know that as you learn, those things are exactly interchangeable. They're, they're equivalent. There's no big difference. There's no right or wrong either. You'll just see most people do it this way. Most, most programmers, once they get used to what a return statement does, they'll do it this way most of the time. I'm sorry? Uh, not sure I quite follow the question. So you're saying I need what, both of what? You're saying if I, so if I did this, Yeah, 
Yeah, so I can't, if I just do this without the, if I take this out, is this your question? Yeah, that won't do anything. Well, it'll do something. It'll multiply x times x and put it in a variable, but it won't give it back to the user. The return is what actually hands that data back to the person that called the function. Okay, so I do need that piece. If I don't put return, nothing gets passed back. All right, let's revert. Cool, so, okay, so we're at this console.log. What's happening here is that I'm gonna call the function square with the value two, and then immediately, I'm gonna take whatever that answer is, whatever that function gives me back, and I'm gonna print it. So now we should see something put out. There we go, all right. Four, exactly what we expected. Cool, right, let's do a couple more of these. Let's do copy, paste. Uh, what else can I square? Let's do something like not obvious. Let's take 4.5, let's see what happens there. Not an integer, but our function, our code should still work, right? Um, what if I were to square something crazy like false? Guesses? Yeah. On here, undefined, I heard zero, I heard errors. Actually, I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, because because basically it's not going to make sense. Like to our human brains, taking false times false doesn't make sense, right? It is, like what would be the result of this? Like what's a logical thing that false times false could equal? Who knows? I don't know. JavaScript is going to make sense. If you try to do something like this, JavaScript will either just do one of two things. It'll just kind of blow up and it'll just quit and say, hey, that's really dumb. I don't know how to deal with that. Or it will try to be really smart and try to take that false and try to turn it into something that it can multiply times itself. Um, and let's just see what happens. Zero. Ah, that's what happens. So in the world of Booleans, true and false are often, uh, if you want to think of these as numbers, they're often um, kind of interchangeable in some settings with the numbers uh, one and zero. One being true, zero being false. So here what JavaScript is doing is it's going to take that value of false, it says, when I call the function, it's going to say, oh, you want to multiply false times false? I don't know how to do that. What can I turn false into that you can multiply by something else? The number zero, and so it turns it into a zero, and you get zero times zero. So if that all kind of went over your head, that's, that's fine. The lesson is just that in JavaScript, you need to be very careful about what you're passing around. It will sometimes do things like this that are unexpected or are uncertain. So if you really need this function, if your program depends, if like, if it doesn't square this number right, if, if that means that, you know, I don't know, the stock exchange is going to close down or something, you should make sure that it's a number before you try to multiply it by itself. You're the, ones that, you're the one that's responsible for checking that it actually is a number. Yes. Uh, right here. Yeah, you can, uh, there's like different words you can use. Input parameter is probably like the best, the best one. Okay, um, another one, another crazy one. Let's try, well, squirrel bars. Square squirrel. All right, again, we gave uh, our function, which really only works properly if you give it numbers. We gave it something that wasn't a number and something crazy happened. Uh, what did it print out? It printed out this thing right there, N-A-N. This is another, like undefined, this is another special value in JavaScript. And NAN means not a number, okay? If you try to multiply two things that are not, that don't have like an obvious conversion to a number, they'll be turned into not a numbers. Yeah. Good question. So here in this case, um, I'm just printing it out right away, okay? So you can visualize when I call, when I say, when this, con when this line of code runs, console.log square two, you can visualize things happening in this order. The square function is called with the value two, right? It computes that result, four. It then replaces it here, like that, and then it gets printed out right away. 
So that's one way to access it is just to use it right away. You, whatever that return function, whatever the function returns, wherever you're calling that function, you can think of it as replacing that function call with the return value. So you can think of it as doing that, as replacing that, okay? Uh, you can also put it in a variable like we saw before. So I can say var2 squared, do this. These are, these are, these are equivalent. Uh, and what happens here is that I call this function, the return value is in some kind of hand wavy way substituted for that, the answer. And then I've got this new variable that's being set equal to four. And then when I print it out, left off the prints. When I print it out, it's going to print out the value of that variable. So those are the two primary ways you you'll use the return value of a variable is to put it into another var or of a function rather to put it inside of a variable or to just use it right away. But the return value you think of as replacing the function call. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Those are really great questions. Okay. So uh, what are the lessons we learned? Let's kind of reiterate on functions. Functions, um, let's go back to our anatomy diagram. Now we can actually understand all this, this nonsense. So the anatomy diagram we've got, uh, this tells us exactly, this kind of encapsulates every kind of possible, the, the pieces of every possible function you could write, okay? You've got the keyword function, which says, I am going to make a function right now. What you put after it is the name of the function. If you want to call it later, you have to use this name. Then you've got open and close parens. Open and close parens will wrap your input parameters, okay? So you can have zero to 255 of those. And you put those in between. And the rules for input parameters are basically the same as variables, no spaces, no crazy business. Uh, and you comma separate them. If you don't have any input parameters, though, you still need the parens. So while you don't have to, you can write functions without input parameters, you still need to put the parens there no matter what in the function definition. The parens are required. Uh, then we have curly braces. We have a pair of those, an open and a close at the bottom. And the curly braces signify the body of the function. Whatever's between those is called the body. It's the code that runs when you call the function, OK? And then in this example, they just have one line of code. And then they have a return statement. So return statements are um, they're the way you hand data back to the person that called the function. And they're optional. You don't have to return something in your function. Your function can just go do something, say print a message to the screen, without returning any data to the user. They're totally optional. But most functions will return something. Okay. Any questions on the pieces of, uh, of the function? the anatomy there. Uh, one more point before we move on from functions is I just said uh, something that um, we saw, which is that you don't have to return something, right? What happens if I have a function that doesn't return anything? message, it doesn't return anything. What if I then try to put that, what if I try to do something like this? I try to say, uh, you know, var, I'm being uncreative right now, we'll call it var y. Or to do this. It prints out a message, it doesn't return anything, but then when I call the function, I'm trying to put that return value into a variable, okay? This is trying to assign to the variable y whatever no return returns, but no return doesn't return anything. What do we think might happen? Any guesses? Error, that's a good guess. Uh, any other guesses? We've seen kind of similar situations before. Um, Uh, say it again. To the string. Um, okay, so it could set the, the, the guess was that it could set the value to the string here. What's really going to happen is that, um, well, let's just, I'll just show you. Uh, 
So if you do not put a return statement in your function, there's an implicit return statement which returns the value undefined. Okay, so if that too many new pieces just went right over your head, that's cool. Just know that if I don't return something, this I'm trying to set it equal to, I'm trying to set my variable equal to something. If that something doesn't exist, it's going to be undefined. It's the same as say, it's the same as basically saying creating a variable without giving it a value, right? These will be exactly the same uh, scenarios. If I create a value, or if I create a variable, don't give it a value, it's going to be undefined. The same sort of scenario is happening if I try to uh, put the return value of a function inside that variable, but that function actually doesn't return anything. Okay? So if you see undefined, just think in your code, you're gonna, this is going to happen to you at some point sooner, than, sooner rather than later. You're going to see undefined show up in an error message or in a, something you printed to the screen or somewhere. You're going to see that. Think, I have a variable that I didn't put anything inside of, or I called a function that didn't return anything. Those are kind of the two most common scenarios. Okay. Cool. Let's see what's next. So that's functions. Again, that was a pretty whirlwind tour of functions. Uh, it's going to take you probably a little while. If you're totally new to programming, it'll probably take you a little bit to get totally comfortable with them, but that's okay. To get practice in your um, in your homework. So let's move on to conditionals. And I was going to do kind of like a an exercise where we coded for ten minutes and kind of use that as a midpoint break, but we're nowhere near the midpoint, which means we're not going to get to everything I thought we would. Um, so let's maybe talk about conditionals for a minute, then we'll take like a ten minute break. Cool. So conditionals, uh, one of the other aspects of programs that we talked about last time but didn't actually see how they worked are that conditionals are that programs let us make decisions. Okay, they let us decide things. Um, we haven't had a scenario where we've made a decision in our program yet. Our programs have just all run. They've just gone top to bottom, period. Every line of code is executed. We haven't asked any questions. We haven't made any decisions. Conditionals are, are going to be what allow us to make decisions. So um, here's the definition-y definition uh, thing of, for conditionals. Conditional blocks let us make decisions in our code. We can ask a question. So you could, for example, say, is this the weekend? Is today Tuesday? Um, are you old enough to vote? Uh, and carry out operations based on whether or not the Boolean is true or false, based on whether or not a situation is one way or the other. It allows us to do different things based on the state of our program. Okay? If I, I could write a function, for example, that uh, checked what day of the week it is. If it was a Saturday or Sunday, it would print out the message, this is the weekend. If it wasn't a Saturday or Sunday, Monday through Friday, it would print out, time to go to work. Okay, I can make a decision based on what current, the current day was and have my, my function do different things based on that uh, situation. So that's the kind, of, the kind of thing you want to think about with conditionals, that you have branching. You have this idea of asking a question and then based on that answer, doing different things. So we'll see exactly what that means in a second. Um, and most often when you're looking at code references or books, conditionals are going to be referred to as if-else statements. Why is that the case? That's because the way we actually use the idea of a condition in code is to use if-else. Okay, so let me, let me um, make our first conditional and then I'll... Right. And we'll dissect what I'm what I'm doing here. Okay. Um, so. And I'm just going to create a variable called num, and I'll set it equal to b5. Okay. Uh, we'll do something a little bit more complicated with this in a second, so it's not so such a trivial example. So here's our first conditional that we've that we've seen, and conditionals don't all have to look exactly like this. Let me actually back up and let me just say this. Let me just do this. Let me do a simpler form. This is a valid way to write a conditional. You can, um, well, so what's this doing? The main components, similar to functions here, you've got a keyword here, if. If is a special word. It says, I'm about to ask a question. I want to test if something's true or not. What's in parens is the question that I'm asking. That thing in parens 
should evaluate to a Boolean. All that means is that it's basically something that will be, at the end of the day, true or false. After I compute whatever's inside the parentheses, it'll be true or false. Okay. Um, and I'll break that down in a second, but basically that, that statement checks to see if a number is even. If it is even, I'm going to execute what's inside the curly braces. The curly braces are um, the, the block associated with the, the if condition. It's going to execute whatever's inside of those. If that condition is not true, it's going to skip over it. Okay, so if my number is odd, I'm going to skip over that line of code and I won't actually execute anything. So let's, let's start with an even number, actually. Let's just run this example with uh, num equal to 4. Again, wrong panel. There we go. Okay, so num is equal to 4. The statement checks to see if it's even or not. Um, I'll dissect that statement for you in a second. It happens that 4 is even, and so it prints out this message. If I were to then say num is equal to 5, and repeat this stuff, I would get the first one prints out because at this point I have an even number, but down here I have an odd number. So it checks the condition. It says if my number is odd, oh, it's not odd, so I'm going to skip what's between the curly braces. Okay? Is that clear? We have if, which allows us to run a check on something to evaluate a condition as true or false. If it is true, it's going to run the code inside of the curly braces. If it's not true, it's going to skip that code. Uh, just again, you, you'll see this happen a lot, braces on different lines, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at this, this, what's being evaluated here before we kind of look at more complicated if statements. This condition in here that I'm checking, it says num percent to triple equals zero. So let's break this down. It's uh, one piece at a time. First, the triple equals, which we've seen before. Triple equals does what? It will check the things on either side to see if they're the same. It's comparing them, okay? Double equals will do almost the same thing. Triple equals is a little bit better. Double and triple equals at this point in our knowledge, we can think of as being the same. Um, so it's going to check to say, is the thing on the left the same as the thing on the right? Okay? So what is the thing on the left? This is obviously just zero. The thing on the left here is a little bit more complicated. Num percent two. I've got a variable called num, and I'm saying percent two. Percent is, a, is an operator that does modular division. So if that phrase just sounded like gibberish, modular division is the remainder after you divide something. Okay, what does it mean for a number to be even? It means if you divide it by 2, you get 0, right? 3 divided by 2 is 1. 5 divided by 2 is 1. You get 0. Uh, well, sorry, the remainder of 3 divided by 2 is 1. The remainder of 5 divided by 2 is 1. It means if you divide something by 2, you get a remainder of 0. That's what it means to be even. It means it's a multiple of 2. Those are the same statement. Remainder of division by 2 is 0. Multiple of 2, those are equivalent. So the the percent sign is a modulus operator. It says, give me the remainder of dividing the left-hand side by the right side. Take the number, divide it by two, and give me what's left over. So it's modular division. Okay? If that's um, still a little bit fuzzy, uh, I'll try to find like a, a modular division, some exercises to put into the, uh, the, the homework. So this is going to say, if the number uh, modulo two is equal to zero, then it must be even. I'm going to print out the message even. Okay? Any questions at that part? Okay, so now let's add one more piece to our conditional. Let's add something called an else. Okay, so What's happening here is that we still have the same behavior with the first half of this statement. We still have the same behavior uh, where we check to see if the number is even. If so, we print out the message, even. However, if that condition in, in the if statement, that condition num percent to triple equals zero, if that happens to be false, now I'm saying, okay, you're going to skip the line, you're going to skip line 12 right here, but go ahead and run this one. So it says, if the thing in parentheses is false, 
run the second statement. If it's true, you run what's inside the first block. If it's false, you run what's inside the second block. So it lets us basically do one or one of two things based on uh, the value of that statement. So let's let's do this. Let's make number five. Here and run. Okay. So what happened there? So let's line by line. We have a variable num equal to five. I check here. I say if num percent two is equal to zero. Is my number even? Well, 5% 2 is 1. The remainder of dividing 5 by 2 is 1. That's not equal to 0. So I'm going to skip this line. And up to this point, it's the same behavior as we saw before, right? The new piece is I skipped this line because my condition was false, which means I should run whatever is inside the else. If this is not true, do this. Okay? And so it's going to print out odd. Um, does that make sense to folks? do this or do that based on whether or not it's true or false. And as the question earlier, a Boolean can only be true or false. Those are the only two scenarios you can have. So uh, that's, the, that's kind of how this works out. Cool. Let's go ahead and take like a 10 to 12 minute break right now. And we'll come back and we'll look at a little bit more with conditionals and uh, incorporate conditionals and functions together. Okay. So let's say 11, 20. All right, folks, um, we'll get started again. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning we're going to try to get to loops. I just decided we're not, we're not going to even bother because uh, I really want to focus on some conditionals and a little bit of problem solving kind of stuff and putting some of these concepts together. So we'll just defer loops until next time. Um, the reason I was trying to, I was hoping to try to get to them today is that uh, kind of traditionally the last class period for Hello World will take all the concepts we've learned and use them to write some code within a web page and put together in sort of this bigger project, which which looks a little bit more like cool and hip and attractive than like the little kind of code snippets we're doing here. So it allows you to do something that's a little bit more like actual programming, seeing something in the real world, et cetera. So we won't have as much time to do that next time, but you'll still be able to work on that and I'll still have all the instructions available for that. And we'll 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 have some time to look at that uh that project next time. Um, but I think it's probably more important for us to like really get some of these ideas uh, solidified. Okay, so let's do a little bit more with conditionals here to, in terms of the definition. I just want to introduce uh, one more idea. Um, and uh, let's see. And let's say... Do it by looking at the voting example. So here I want to say... Assume that I've got some variable called age. Right now we'll say it's 23. And I want to write a conditional that will print, that will check the age and see if the person's eligible to vote. If so, it'll print a message that say, hey, you're able to vote. If not, it'll say, sorry, you're not old enough. So let's kind of, uh, let's break that down. So I'm going to start using comments a little bit to kind of uh, indicate what I want to do to solve the problem before I write the code. This is a really useful exercise. So in the in the homework and pre-work for this last class, for this class rather, um, you were introduced to pseudocoding, okay? And I said that something with the fourth class of Hello World, we typically spend a lot of time on that. Um, pseudocoding is a way for you to think about breaking down problems before you start doing the hard work of actually writing the code. It's really easy, especially when you're starting out to get so wrapped up in the mechanics of writing code, am I missing a brace? Did I calculate this thing correctly? Where's, do I have, am I calling the right function? That you miss out on the pieces of the problem that you're trying to solve. So you kind of think of like the mechanics of writing a program that works and the mechanics of solving a problem should in your brain be kind of separate things. So using pseudocode, using comments to kind of outline your work are both ways of separating the mechanics of problem solving from the mechanics of actually coding and that'll help you get better more quickly. It'll help you solve problems more efficiently. It'll help you write better code, et cetera. So all good programmers are really good at doing this. They're able to uh, think about the solution to a problem before they ever start coding and not confuse those two. So um, let's just kind of write down in comments what I want to do with this. So I say I want to, first I want to check to see if um, age is at least 18. If so, print nice message. Uh, 
otherwise. And So those are the three things we really want to do. Um, how can how can I now do those? So we have the mechanics now to do this. Now that we know conditionals, so I want to check to see if someone is at least eighteen. So I have age, and I can say age greater than equal eighteen. That'll check to see if someone's at least eighteen, right? Um, but then I want to do something based on whether or not that's true or false, which means I need a conditional here. So I can say if age is at least 18, let's do something. Let's print a nice message out. I'm going to leave a, a line or two there for that to work. So I can go back and add the code. Otherwise, another message. So. Okay, so I'm just going to stub out the different sections of my code here. So I have I have the pieces of my condition outlined. I have an if, and I'm checking to see if the age variable is at least 18. Okay. And in the case that it's not at least 18, I want to uh, print out um, another message. Okay. So let's just go ahead and do that. Oops. Not 18. We'll, we'll let them down. We'll disappoint them. Okay. Everybody okay with this so far? Just using our ifs and elses in a different situation than we did with our evens and odds. So when I run this code now, what should print out? You can vote. Yeah, and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this stuff. Let's see that. Line 22. The the comment here. Uh, the co comments are don't really matter at all for the purposes of code. Uh, Yeah, you can put comments anywhere. I can put a comment right here. This is a special kind of comment. Right there, rules to work. So, comment T slash star. Um, that's a special kind of comment that has to be closed. It has to have a, a star slash at the end, and then everything between that pair is a comment. So you can do it to do weird things like this to put a comment in a weird place where it might not otherwise go. Or you can make comments that go across multiple lines. So at the top of these files, I've got slash star. This whole thing is a comment because it ends with star slash. So comments, when the code gets run, basically those are just wiped out and JavaScript doesn't even look at them. They're just for us to look at. So they can go pretty much anywhere. OK, so that did what we expected it to, right? No, no big surprise. It printed out you can vote, which is good. That's what we wanted to happen. Now, suppose I want my code to be a little bit more robust. Well, before we do that, let's just Let's just test to see if it works right in the other case. With age equal to 17, and it does the right thing. It says, sorry, not old enough yet. That's because when I hit this check, it said, is 17 greater than or equal to 18? No, that's not true. That's false. So I'm going to execute the else block. All right, so suppose I want to make my code a little bit more robust here. What if somebody gave me, um, I don't know, like, that, or even worse, that. Let's actually do this different separately. So that's a bad example. Let me do with this. So somebody gave me something like this. What should my program do? In its current state, it's going to say, is age greater than or equal to 18? That's a string compared to a number. JavaScript is basically going to do something which we're not really sure. It's going to try to make some sense out of that. But generically, it's going to say, no, that's not a true statement. The string is not greater than or equal to 18. 
and then it's going to hit the else block. All right. Um, but that really doesn't make sense in this scenario, right? There's the string. We really don't want to print. It's that like this is not even if this wasn't an age, if this was like red. Something's not right here, right? This behavior isn't really something we would expect as a programmer or somebody using this program. It says that Fred is not, if, you're, if your age is Fred, you're not old enough to vote yet. What does that mean? I don't know. Well, let's actually look at another way to approach this. There's another way you can, and if, an el if else will allow you to branch in two directions, it says if this is true, um, go this way. If it's false, go that way. We can actually make it a little bit more complicated. We can say um, else if age greater than zero, then I'm going to say that they're not able to vote. So I'm going to add, let me just, um, and we'll go back and dissect these. So here I introduced a new piece of code. I introduced this thing, else if. This allows us to chain together several different checks within the same if else structure. It allows us not to check to see if something's true or false, but to check if any range of conditions are true. So first I'm going to say, is age greater than or equal to 18? If it happens to be greater than or equal to 18, I'm going to print out this message. And then I'm going to skip the rest of this stuff because my that condition evaluated to true. I'm just going to skip everything else. If it's false, I'm going to go down to this, this next line and I'm going to check this condition. I'm going to say, is age greater than or equal to zero? If that happens to be true, I'm going to execute the code that's between those braces and then skip the rest of it. If that happens to be false, then and only then am I going to come down and execute what's inside the else block. OK? Question. Uh, that's not, well, so that, to require that it's a number is a, sort of different than checking like greater than or equal to or those sorts of things. It's a little bit more of a complicated check. Um, you could do something like, something we have seen so far is you could say, uh, you could do something like this. We did see this last week, right? We did use this type of thing. We used that last week to say what type of data is this variable? Is it a number? Is it a Boolean? Is it a string? You could do something like that. Um, and you could say, if type of the variable is not a number, then I'm just going to print an error message or quit or do whatever. Um, but you would need to do something like that. There's other ways to kind of check the type to see if it's actually a number or not. Um, in this case, though, we're going to kind of use this will also cover the situation if somebody gives us a negative age, too. So it's not just checking that it's a number. It's also giving if somebody gives us an invalid age. So let's see what happens when I run this code. It says, you don't make sense. And my message doesn't make sense either. Um, because what happened is this evaluates to false. This evaluates to false. And so it executes the third one. And I could put more of these, too. You could put any number of else ifs together, together, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Uh, so it's a way, if, you know, you think of if else as like, the, the, the way you're initially taught it is that you know, it checks to see if something's true, and if it's not true, it does something else. It's really, though, uh, if else's will allow you to check any number of different conditions. Um, so I'm trying to think of, this is not like probably the most real world example, but uh, it still illustrates kind of what's going on, that you can chain these things together. Any questions about how else if combines with these. These are all kind of optional too. I can leave off, just as before, I can leave that off too. I don't have to put else ifs. I don't have to put an else. I can kind of do whatever I want there. Cool. Any questions? All right. With the time we have left, um, we're going to look at a couple of exercises. I'm going to kind of give you two things to look at. I'm going to make a new JS bin. And you can choose to work on whichever one you like. And um, 
I'll put both of these kind of up in the homework section too. So if you don't get a chance, if you want to try to try both of them, uh, you can do that. Um, but just pick one of them for today. So first one will be to write a function that takes two variables as input. You can call them A and B. Be one one example for now. That one I realize it's wrong with that one. Say so write a um, function that returns true. That, well, let's see what input it takes. That takes a number as input and returns true if that number is a multiple. So you have all the pieces to do this, okay? And I'll kind of stub out a couple of them for you here. Um, and if if doing all these things at once um, seems kind of complicated, start by doing this. Returns true if that number is even. Okay, so you can start with that, and then have that to be so let's go ahead and write um, the main pieces of these. So I need to write a function and get a single input parameter on a num. And what should it do? It should return true if um, it is even return false. Um, is odd. Okay. And you're going to want to write some sample code down here to check it. You can say console.log and give my function a name. Sorry. Is even. Log is even five. Check it on the value five. You can check it on the value nine. Just try some different test inputs to see how your code runs, okay? Once you get the even part down, go ahead and make another function that's basically, it should look almost identical, but it should check to see if something's a multiple of three and run some test code on that, okay? So basically your job is to try to, for the rest of class, to try to write this code that should go in in the body of this function uh, and you know maybe add a couple other tests there to test it with various uh, inputs. So I'll be walking around to help everybody. Um, I don't know if we had any mentors today. The holiday weekend, I think they were both unable to come. So I'll try to help everybody as much as I can. I'll also put this up on the homework page too. So, um, and let me see if there were any other announcements in my slides that we needed to. Nope, that's it. Cool. All right. So yeah, hang around, work. I'll, uh, you know, if you want to hang out past noon, I'll probably be around until one as well. So other than that, uh, have a great holiday weekend. We'll see you next week. And again, I'll post the lecture videos and all the material online uh, by Monday.